lift an order blocking the president's executive action from going into effect. It rejected the government's request upholding the decision of a Texas judge. 26 states claim the president's action was unconstitutional. The government could appeal either to the full appeals court or the Supreme Court. At least 11 people are dead after storms in Oklahoma and Texas. Several other people were still missing Tuesday after their vacation home in Texas was washed away. Thousands of abandoned vehicles are scattered about in Houston, Texas, where this National Weather Service forecaster does not see an end to the rain anytime soon. We're in this uh, kind of wet pattern, at least for the next week or so, perhaps a bit longer. The mayor of New Orleans wants to protect the city's economy while Louisiana's governor demands religious freedom for citizens. When a legislative committee rejected a bill to protect religious freedom from the onslaught of special rights for homosexuals, Governor Bobby Jindal issued an executive order protecting religious freedom. Now, New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landreau has issued an executive order welcoming homosexuals. AFN talked with Gene Mills of the Louisiana Family Forum. I would summarize it by saying the executive order that he's written is not worth the paper it's written on. It's a method to walk back some of the outrageous claims. One being that protecting religious freedom would damage the economy, especially tourism in New Orleans. This has become pure political theater. I think Bobby has demonstrated that the state of Louisiana is one of the top three or five economic comeback kids in the country right now. And so my sense is you can have both and you can have them vigorously defended. The question has been raised, though, as to whether politicians are now considering economic factors to trump religious freedom. I'm Charlie Butt. Police in Cleveland, Ohio, will undergo new training and see new guidelines on the use of force. It is part of the overhaul of the city's police department, outlined in a 105-page agreement with the U.S. Justice Department. The procedures for investigating misconduct allegations will be changed, and police will be trained in avoiding racial stereotyping and dealing with the mentally ill. The Justice Department had conducted an 18-month investigation of the department and, according to the Justice Department, found a pattern of excessive force and other abuses. An expert on religion and culture says a recent poll showing 61 percent of Americans believe racial harmony is worse than it was 20 years ago reveals the country needs to return to the values and morals on which America was based. The recent CBS New York Times poll also marked the first time since 1997 that majorities of both white and black respondents believe race relations are poor. Dr. Alex McFarland, co-host of American Family Radio's Exploring the Word program, says there are a couple of factors that attribute to this racial disharmony. Foremost, the breakdown of the family. Young people, especially young males, that really don't grow up under the love, stability, and accountability of a mother and father there's also the abandonment of a biblical worldview, a biblical worldview that says people are made in the image of God and all people have worth and value and dignity uh, because they're made in God's image. McFarland also believes that a new generation of young people must be educated that America is still the land of opportunity. But that opportunity comes only if we're willing to work hard, live morally, do our best, become people of excellence, He says all ethnicities need this message. I'm Bill Bumpus. And a Western Illinois couple recently celebrated the birth of their 100th grandchild. Leo Zanger tells the Quincy Herald Whig that, quote, the good Lord has just kept sending them, end quote. The Zangers have been married 59 years and have 12 children. Most of the family lives in the same area. When they get together, they rent a church hall, and it takes 50 pounds of ham or 10 turkeys to feed everyone. 100 days, 100 subscribers at $7 will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. $7 a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the gospel of the kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support. Dot First Amendment Radio dot com. You're listening to First Amendment Radio dot com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at First Amendment Radio dot com. Hey everyone, this is Mary Chamish, and I've got a great guest, an old friend. Um, well. 
it's Barry Rothman, of course. And I'm going to go into the more controversial side of, of, of I've been reading this writing for a full day. And now I'm going to look what his claim against the Vatican and his son was that they were willing to send their own priests to the Nazis to be exterminated. On the other hand, they made sure they stood up for their pedophiles and they shifted from uh, shifted them from one diocese to the next and saved their lives. And he finds that very, very problematic. And I'm going to go into that, start with that, and then go into his own personal relationship. Why do you find that so problematic? Well, I mean, the idea that the Catholic Church would was asked to intervene to save uh, two priests, two, two Catholic priests who had Jewish uh, ancestry, or blood as they would call it, and refused. But, but you know, here you've got uh, thousands upon thousands of priests that are pedophiles, uh, you know, that lawsuits up the kazoo around the world as a result of it. And when the church was notified, most often what would happen was that they would take a priest and simply move him from one church to another or one, uh, one archdiocese, uh, you know, to, to another and, and protect the guy. So it was kind of a good old boys uh, club over there, but good old boys, uh, you know, in the wrong way. Uh, I don't see how that could possibly can be compatible with, with uh, Catholic or Christian theology as it was initially. So I, I just point to that as another source of, of great corruption over here. Well, uh, let's I know. Add, that, I heard uh, an advertisement for something Protestant. Uh, well, it was we'll get to, come to back that. On. We'll get to and that. And I know that uh, Protestants uh, look to the Book of Revelation. Barry, you got to slow down. Statement. And and think that the Barry, mother of Barry, yeah, you have Barry. to slow. <laughs> you have to slow down. Okay. All right, we'll get to that. All right, don't worry, it's on the agenda, but we've got to go with your order. You take the uh, decision to protect your pedophiles and conv- and you don't worry, contrast just, that. You said you're oh, come on, let me finish. Not mine. Okay, go ahead. Don't and make it sound contrast- like I'm associated with them. I have to, I have to stand and, and, and correct that. You know, you, you misspoke on that. Go ahead. And you contrast that with Orthodox Judaism that steers clear of a massive homosexuality. Pedophilia, right. uh, pedophilia is worse than, it's not the same, but neither here nor there. Your s- rabbis have to get married before the age of 23, and that prevents that. And your son did what he was required and married before 23. Was this for love? You know what, Barry? Um, I'm Orthodox, but there's different versions of Orthodox within the Jewish <laughs> religion. And, uh, you know, uh, there'll be differences of opinion from one yeshiva to another. Uh, the first that I heard of this, uh, he called me up in a, on a December uh, night and said, Dad, I'm getting married in three months. And I said, well, who is she? I had a real concern because, you know, he was supposed to, after, after he got his, I will tell you, he has an MIT geophysics degree. So after he got that, he had orders to Space Command. And I thought he had a good shot at being an astronaut, which kind of relates to what I thought we were going to talk about this hour on, on Mars. It will get to it. But at any rate, uh, he calls me and says he's going to marry in three months. So I said, well, who is she? And he said, I don't know. I haven't met her yet. And so, but, you know, they want me to be married by the time I'm 23. So, you know, he had a date with a girl and uh, not, not in the city where his yeshiva was. And then he flew down to Florida and she went to her uncle's and he came to my place. I gave him a car to go down and see her and I said, can we meet her? And he says, no, it's not done on the second date. So then they go to their third date and I get a call from her parents saying, congratulations, it's a match. And I had nothing to say about it. Uh, whatsoever, uh, but the pressure that he was experiencing in school was evidently sufficient that uh, he just went along with it. Does he love her? I have no idea. They have. How's uh, the we're marriage? Not close. We're not close. How's uh, the marriage? Yeah, there were a lot of things. I don't. I don't want to go into what went wrong with our relationship. I was just tell you that the, the kids no, no, that grew up. No, no, not your marriage. 
house I'm is not talking married. About I'm talking about my son's marriage. It didn't. Oh. oh. oh yeah, I'm talking about if I thought you asked is his his marriage good. Is and it? I, I presume it's okay because they have at good. least six kids. Good. Good. But you know, my marriage is fine with my wife right now. We've been married for uh, thirty-two and a half years. <laughs> That's good to hear. But the major point was yours that massive pedophilia in the Catholic Church is prevented in Orthodox Judaism by forcing the rabbis, uh, well, not to be a home, well, not to be homosexual, forcing them to get married. Whether they're straight or gay, they have to get married before they're 23. Well, uh, let's, be, let's be clear about this. You know, um, I'm not going to say there are no Orthodox rabbis who are homosexual, but I never met one, okay? And I've met a lot of rabbis in my life. I have met conservative or reform rabbis who are. Oh, God. But as an Orthodox Jew, we don't recognize really I know plenty of Judaism. cases you know there you are, know that you, know, you come to Israel and you you know you can you can use a reform conversion or a conservative conversion for purposes of citizenship but will you really be accepted you know the records they keep and you know the problems that are associated with that and and the reason why they're not accepted is the fact that you have the reform the conservative Jews the Judaism wings today are willing to say okay on homosexual marriage Orthodox Judaism, no way. No way. So, All right, if so for so that it reason... It certainly is not encouraged to go into the rabbinic in Orthodox Judaism if you're homosexual. That doesn't mean it never happens. But it's not gonna, they're not going to come out of the closet. If they come out of the closet, so they're going to be thrown out of the synagogue. Primarily, <laughs> because of that reason, you don't accept any other version of Judaism other than Orthodox Judaism well, and... Well, I'll tell you something. You're throwing away most of your people. Could be. Could be. You know, I don't think that, you know, unlike Christianity, where they're looking to, you know, convert the world, or Islam is looking to convert the world, in Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, we've never been big on looking for converts. In fact, a legitimate Orthodox rabbi, if you go to him and you say, you're not, if you're not Jewish, I want to convert and be Jewish. The answer you should get is from the rabbis, what are you, nuts? Are you crazy? Do you want to be persecuted? But beyond that, according to Orthodox Judaism, to have salvation, you only have seven laws of Torah to follow. They're called the seven laws of Noah. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit incest, or and most rabbis would say, or adultery. Um, don't be cruel to animals. Don't worship idols. Uh, don't blaspheme God's name. And the only one that's positive of the seven is maintain courts of justice. So if you get called for a jury, you know, you judge according to the facts of the case. You don't judge, it says in Torah, don't respect persons. What does that mean? That means that you don't vote for a guy because he's rich, or you don't go vote for a guy because he's poor and you want to see him get All some right, money. These are very easy uh, rules. Yeah, they're pretty easy. But we don't, but we say, if you want to be Jewish, now you've got 613 commandments to worry about. You can't follow one of them because some depend on having a temple in existence, and, you know, that was destroyed by Rome. You know, hopefully we'll get one back when we have a, a, a religious leadership in Israel that has the courage to do it. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it, we're not looking for the converts. My, well, you, know, you, if, you if, if you have somebody really who aren't. wants to convert sincerely, after they've been turned away three, I think two times or three times, then if they still come back and say, but I feel this in my soul, I've got to have it, then okay. But I know, um, you know, you know my wife, and, and she was a convert. Uh, but, you know, she had to learn, she had to keep the Sabbath. That means no driving, that means no spending money, and no TV, as you mentioned before. <laughs> you know, uh, and a lot of things that, that she won't, she can't do, is keeping kosher, Going to the mikvah, you know, a woman has to have a, a ritual immersion every month until she gets uh, the menopause before her husband can have sex with her. So that's about roughly five days of the period plus seven days after. It's 12 days a and month. And you're saying sex. that's the only Judaism to go through I'm that. Saying, okay, I'm saying this, that Judaism stood for certain principles for thousands of years. 
And then we had, in Germany, Reform Judaism start up because what was the desire? The desire is we're going to be like everybody else. We're going to fit in. We're going to be good, loyal German citizens and be like all the other Germans. We got the Holocaust in, in, in repayment for yeah, that. That's a Holocaust for more well complicated for reasons than that. Well, whatever reasons. The fact is it didn't no. work. No, it it's work. not for whatever reason. But more than that, you see, when you start taking, this is the, the, the criticism I had of the Catholic Church. The same criticism applies to the Jewish people who want to take the Torah or sections of it and tear it out and throw it away. Once you do that, you're creating a God with your own hands. That is idolatry. Either God said certain things or he didn't. God, God, God was not uh, something that was meant to be only politically correct. Either what he said was right or wrong. Sodom and Gomorrah either was destroyed for a reason, which the Bible makes it pretty clear, you know, was homosexuality, or what? Uh, you know what? I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop you before it goes. It, it carries on. I'm going to stick to what you sent. Now look. We're about to go on to the next topic, uh, which is eventually your utter defense of Protestants. Uh, we'll get to that. First of all, uh, you, you substantiate what you're about to say, that the Protestants are fairly loyal to Israel, even if we know it's uh, they want to see all the Jews eventually converted to Christianity. I've lost a lot of friends over that. They treat you like savages, and out they go. They're no longer friends. Um, but nonetheless, you recognize this. But, all right, here's the part that drives me crazy. Your quote, by the way, um, some would go on to include America, who did little to help the Jews escape from Germany before World War II. They organized the Wannacy Conference in France in 1937 to save the Jews. It, they tried to save the Jews of Europe, but the labor Zionists spent two, three years whittling down this damn want to see conference if it wasn't for israel there may very well not have been a holocaust soak that in well i i would ask you to soak in the 28th chapter of the book of uh, deuteronomy and that's uh, too long there, ago. Okay, i'm talking about history. specifically what i'm talking about is this that god said, you know, if you follow my laws, here's a bunch of blessings. I think there's 13 verses of blessings followed by 52 verses of curses if you don't follow. You will be slaughtered. And the Holocaust I was gotcha. pretty well described over there. It predicted, you know, almost what, 3,300 years or so before it happened. I'm going to say it again. Without labor Zionism fighting the results of the Wannacy Conference, the Jews might have been saved. Um, maybe. I don't know. There's uh, where I only know what happens. I know that, 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 that there are a lot of people that uh, made mistakes on, on all sides. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the United States. I'm a retired Coast Guard officer. I'm very proud. I have a, a history of 34 years of service between the Coast Guard and the Navy. And so normally uh, I don't wear a kippah. Normally I have a hat on my head that's got Coast, U.S. Coast Guard retired, proudly served, and I've got uh, the Coast Guard officer's crest on it. Typically, where unless I'm on an expedition uh, someplace, in which case I have my Indiana Jones. Hat. Oh, I hope this is but, leading but to in the something. Coast Guard, I have to tell you, we met uh, at the liner St. Louis from Germany, and off the coast of Miami Beach, they could see the lights of Miami Beach. They were told, "Come no closer than three miles, or we'll open fire on you." And it had 900, I think, around 917 or 918 refugees from Dachau on board. They sailed around in circles. Uh, one, one had got off in Cuba because she had a, uh, a Jewish child over there. Uh, but uh, around in circles, uh, the U.S. did not let them in, and it wound up, uh, at, uh, I think a couple hundred went to England, a couple hundred, they were pretty much safe. A couple hundred went to France, a couple hundred went to Holland. A lot of those got killed in the Holocaust. The rest went back to Hamburg, and they were pretty much, I think, executed. 
uh, didn't work so well for him. So it doesn't mean I'm not proud of serving in the Coast Guard. Uh, you know, the country was, was when I was young, uh, was a lot more bigoted than it is right now, especially when it came to the Jewish people. There were hotels in Miami Beach, the Kenilworth was one, and it had signs and lobbies, no Jews uh, allowed. You know, so I mean, uh, you, you, until the civil rights movement occurred in the United States, and I'm not a liberal, but I do, but I did side with the fact, and I still do, with the fact that nobody should be persecuted because of their race or religion or anything like that. Some people can say, "What about homosexuals?" I, I view that as, a, as, to a certain extent, it's a. a You'll make an lifestyle. exception, okay? I thought <laughs> that, but well, look. it's a question of what you want to control. You know, I mean, as an Orthodox Jew. Who's not all these orthodox? I know what the taste of lobster was, and it was pretty good. I know You're what a that lot of to things were that I used to eat, but uh, I don't eat them now because I keep kosher, and so I control myself. So if there are uh, sexual the things that, that are wanted that are not proper, then um, the question is, can the person control it or not? Thank God I never had a question of uh, of uh, what I was with respect to uh, being a heterosexual, uh, heterosexual or anything like that. But uh, it's tough. But it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of self control and, and and you know what's accepted. I think under the Obama administration, there's been such uh -oh. a push for gay rights in this country. All right, you know what? Let me go backwards. Yeah, by the way, we're not folks. We're not getting he to Mars. doesn't like we Obama. And he sure doesn't have many nice things to say about homosexuals, but he really likes Protestants. And here, boy, you want to talk about a man divided within himself. Look, on the one hand, he really likes Protestants because even though they really think they're going to convert us, uh, they're on our side. Whereas the uh, which is Republican, by the way, whereas whereas liberal Jews, they're all Democrats, so they're wrong. All right, you've got now. Here's your real problem, though. After you establish that sixty percent of evangel evangelical Christians sympathize with Israel a lot, and and all this. You go into the Protestant church, and this is where I know uh, you're right. All right? The Protestant church started with a, uh, an anti-Semite named Martin Luther. In 1543, he wrote a 65,000-word treatise on Jews and their lies. In, well, he denounced Jews and urged their persecution, and he wrote, There's no fault in slaying them. You know, you've got a time now where you can relate to evangelical Christians and Protestants, but it wasn't always that way and may not always be that way. Well, yeah, I discussed exactly what you mentioned. Uh, I think it was in this article. Well, you probably read it. Um, in I read it, history. by the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but, yeah, I, I would say this. First of all, you've got a lot of people in this country if you ask, you know, uh, when was Abraham Lincoln president, they'll think well, during World War II or something. A lot of people don't know history. So I think it's probably a lot like that with That's Protestants kind of... in the United States. I think very few Protestants in the United States are aware of just how anti-Semitic Martin Luther was. I think they've developed an American-style Christianity that, um, you know, can be traced back the there, but I, I don't think that it's right followed now. through. And in most places there are some. I mean, if it's a really right-wing church, that's got pro-Nazi leanings, then they're going to, yeah, they're going to be remembering very much what Martin Luther had to say. But I think that most Protestant Christians would be shocked to see what he had to say. You know, and I mentioned in, uh, I think it was this article, uh, the fact that, um, you know, in, in Germany, people thought Hitler was the reincarnation of Martin Luther. I know Americans, so I tell an American Protestant, I said, what are you talking about? You know, so I actually I put a link up to show, yeah, uh, this, is, this, is, this is what was believed back at that time. So, you know, but what are we dealing with today? Um, I think most Catholics, um, not as, as anti-Semitic as, uh, as, um, as, uh, as the Vatican is, certainly, uh, in the United States. But on the other hand, there's a leadership that, you know, that pushes them in a certain way. And, uh, you know, that way is not friendly to Israel. 
And that's what the polls show, that Catholics are not as supportive of Israel. And that's what I've been discovering, that the leadership of Israel is not friendly to the Jews. And with, without diving into it, we have to look at ourselves. We really have to. We have to stare ourselves in the faces. We got to get rid of this. All well, right? I would it's say this, Mr. Barry. Yeah, we, we've kind of discussed this in previous years, and especially we've discussed Bibi Netanyahu. And I know that I, I think your 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 opinion of him is not as high as my opinion. I know you brought up connections with this with the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations. He was an that, actual that, member for a year. Uh, he yep. goes back to the Boston group. If you want to know where he got inducted, it doesn't matter. I view the leadership, the, you know what, let's plug each other. I'm, I'm going to use the last half hour for fun on Mars. So first of all, folks, this is Barry Chamish. My books are all at lulu.com. That's www.lulu.com. You'll see a search box right in Chamish. C-H-A-M-I-S-H. That'll take you to them. And my website, here's hoping David Salmon kept it up this week, is www.barrychamish.com. Now your turn, Barry Rothman. Okay, I've told you what books I wrote that I don't believe in, it, or at least I, well, I don't sell it. I mean, I, I, I do. The first book, The Great Christ Debate, no, I, I reject that now. The second book, uh, A Matter of Spiritual Custody, is on my website, on, on the home page. Uh, when you go there, you'll see a picture of me in Egypt, um, you know, where I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, which is maybe a subject of another time. On the second line under that, there's a big black bar. It says in the middle, Spiritual Custody. So that book is there. Now, What's if you're interested website? in my current book, no, no. that What's is available website? at Amazon.com. Uh-huh. So on my home page... Uh, of arcode.com, it says on the third line after UFOs, buy arcode. And so if you click on that, it will take you to, um, uh, what is it, uh, um, Amazon. And there, you know, you can buy the book. I will say this much about my interest in the book. The book was published by a Christian friend of mine, Roy Reinhold. Uh, who debated with me about Jesus for many years. We never came to an agreement on that. But he liked the maps that I had found encoded in the Bible, so he published the book. He published 2,000 copies. Uh, I think he sold about 500. It was obviously a losing proposition uh, financially, so we came to a point about four or five years ago. I said, you know what? It costs me more to file uh, for royalties with, in- with, for, with the internal income tax to do the page than I'm getting royalties every year. So you just take all the royalties from the book, and that will you know, pay you back for somewhat for what you've done. So I make no money from the book at all. Roy Reinhold makes it all. But it if you want to buy the matter. book, barcode.com. What's the name of the book? It is available on Amazon. What's the name of it? Okay. No, uh, the name of the what's book the name is, of the book? Okay, name of the book is Arc Code, and the subheading over there, subtitle is Searching for the Ark of the Covenant Using ELS, that's uh, Equidistant Letter Sequence, Maps from the Bible Code. And, um, Fantastic. We have to take three minutes off. Boy, any basic stuff from you. You want to talk pulling teeth. We got it, though. And, folks, we are archived at www.libertyarchives.com for a week if you miss something or anything. We'll be back in three. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States in 1963. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, 
and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no secret is revealed. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. Confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Ladies and gentlemen, the president today. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? I've got a vision for what I want to do for the country. See, I know exactly where I want to lead. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean? Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Hi, folks. This is Barry Chamish. We've got a very interesting guest. Now, the next topic is all about Mars. And, Barry, please go easy for my poor listeners. You present to me evidence, and you did serious studies, that NASA is seriously understating Martian air pressure. Number one, folks, I want you to know he lives in Cape Canaveral. That's the Cocoa Beach of Florida. It's where uh, rockets used to take off. Now they take off from Russia, but it doesn't matter. Why would they understate Martian air pressure? Go Now remember, my listeners don't know what souls are. They don't know what MSL is or REMS weather data. They don't know these things. Now, with that in mind, go to it. Okay. First of all, a little correction over there. Although it's true that currently our, our astronauts are going up from Kazakhstan, at least on uh, unclassified rockets, um, the last rocket that I saw from, my, from the front door of my house here, or my condo in Cape Canaveral, went up on Wednesday, and it was an Atlas V, and it carried the XR-37B, which is, uh, well, it looks like the space shuttle, but it's one quarter the size of the space shuttle. It's a military vehicle. The last time it went up, it went up for 675 days, which, although I don't know that it went there, I, you know, I haven't seen anything that went there, uh, that's long enough to get to Mars and back. And uh, what it does, nobody uh, knows uh, with any kind, with, it, with much less than a top secret clearance, and you have to have a need to know. Um, it's stealth, so it can't be tracked on radar. Uh, we see rockets that, that uh, lift off from our home 
or from the front of our home here about every two weeks, the 24 that we're scheduled for this year. All right, we're so back very much, then. Okay. And, we, and we will be launching men again in about two years' time uh, from Cape Canaveral. So All right. It's a temporary we're, pause. we're corrected. Now, okay, why? Now, no, Mars. Okay. Yes. Um, when my younger son okay, uh, started uh, Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University at the age of 16, he got his B.S. in physics, uh, in space physics, by the age of 18. When he went there, the first year, uh, one of his first teachers said that he had to write a technical paper. And uh, David is his name. David came to me and he said, well, what should I do, Dad? What do you suggest? And I said, well, I don't understand how there can be dust devils on Mars that are so frequent that they can be depended on to clean off solar panels on our landers. Because on Earth, we have an average pressure at sea level of 1,013 millibars, 1,013.25 millibars. On Mars, the average pressure is only 6.1 millibars, so it's almost a total vacuum. So to have a dust devil, which looks like a little miniature tornado, except on Mars, they can be bigger than tornadoes on Earth, but to have some, sometimes, but to have something like that, you have to have a difference in pressure between the outside, what's outside the, the dust devil, and the inside. And if you have almost no air to start off with, it's very hard to see how that could be, how, how such a thing could form in All a place right, like that. All right, there's the confusion. And what did you do about it? All right, so he started the research. And we saw, first of all, that NASA tried to replicate or duplicate dust devils out at uh, Ames in California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. They had a giant vacuum tunnel there, or, uh, and they, they uh, tried to, uh, to spin it up uh, you know, with, with pressure at 10 millibars. Why 10 instead of 6.1? Because it was regular air. Martian air is supposed to be carbon dioxide, 95%. They figured it was roughly equivalent. And they put, you know, some... <clears throat> dust or sand down on the bottom to see could it be stirred up into um, you know into a column like a like a tornado or like a dust devil. We couldn't do it with the kind of of air speeds that they thought dust devils are involved with, uh, like 13 miles an hour on the average. Instead, they had to kick it up to 156 mile an hour winds, like a Category Five hurricane. Then so it's very it windy on Mars. Well, the greatest winds that were ever recorded uh, on the surface so far are about, were about 59 miles an hour, and that was recorded by, I think it was Viking 2. Viking 1 and Viking 2 had very good wind data. Now, they landed in 1976. We have had no lander on Mars since 1976, including the current one, excuse me, that were capable of measuring winds. <clears throat> the current lander, which is the Mars Science Laboratory, landed on August the 6th, 2012. It's the size of, uh, like, a Humvee. You know, it's a good-sized lander. A very, very uh, ambitious thing to land something that big there. But allegedly, when it landed, as uh, the sky crane that lowered it, um, you know, people may be familiar if they saw it on TV, as it was landing, uh, supposedly a rock was, was flicked up by one of the rockets, and it hit the instrument on one of the booms that could measure winds. And it, 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 it just broke it. Now, for nine months or so after that happened, NASA, particularly the REMS team, REMS standing for the Rover Environmental Monitoring Station, they're out of Madrid, Spain, uh, for that period of time, they claim that the wind every day was 2 meters per second from the east, or 7.4 kilometers per, uh, per hour from the east. It never varied. So well, it's a one giant of the things planet. that David and I did was we went back and we looked at 8,333 hours worth of data from Viking 1 and Viking 2, taken about every hour. They divided, they divided the Martian day, which is like 24 hours and 39 minutes or so. They divided it into 25 time bins instead of 24 hours, each about 59 minutes long. So we looked at the winds every single hour for over years, over that many hours I just I spoke about. 
And we found that the maximum winds were, you know, like 59 miles an hour. But there was nowhere near the wind that was needed to, uh, to, to, make, to, gen- to generate dust devils or global dust storms. There's a storm well, that forms over a mountain on Mars called Arcea Mons. The, the mountain is bigger than Everest. It has what looks like hurricane eye walls when it forms, and it, they're 10 kilometers wide. Uh, it's snowing on Mars sometimes at, at Phoenix. We snowing see what? Snow coming from. What's the snowing? We see giant uh, Barkan sand dunes like no, no, what's what in Namibia is, in Africa. What's the snow? Move. Uh, by the, the way, I've seen pictures of it. Greater snow. It's water ice. I've seen pictures of, of the of the polar regions. Uh, there, there is snow, but it's, it's not water snow. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it's it's water ice, and the North Pole complete almost completely. Uh, there's a question of whether there's some frozen carbon dioxide. What there is of frozen, right, frozen so car- that's not, carbon dioxide is, is more at the South Pole, but most of the South Pole is also water ice. Again, that's not water. H2O. Well, it's H2O. CO2. No, it's not CO2. Most of it all is right. H2O. Almost it's all H2O? of the North Pole is H2O. And is only. This proven? Uh, uh, what's that? Has it been proven? Is it yes. proven? Do, does anyone say there is H2O uh, snow caps? Uh, uh, in in the north of Mars. Yeah. yeah, you look online and any place. It's going to tell you what. Just look up Martian polar caps. What's the composition? It'll tell you the North Pole is water ice. It'll tell you the South Pole. There's there's some frozen. There's some some dry ice. Some frozen carbon dioxide. But the bulk of the South Pole is also water ice. For All some right, reason, I'm on not Mars, sure the, the water right. is uh, often uh, there's more heavy water in it than what we find here. By heavy water, I mean that. The hydrogen atom, sometimes it's the isotope of hydrogen called deuterium that we find associated with nuclear reactors that, that uh, can be there. It's a higher percentage on Mars than it is on Earth, but it's mostly water ice. And well, within it's the mostly last water like, ice, months, it's uh, I think it was just in April, uh, NASA announced that there's brine, there's salty water uh, at Gale Crater where the Mars Science Laboratory landed. You know, And in fact, the relative humidity goes to 100% at night. We've also found, found recently that when you go up in altitude, whether it's 10 or 20 miles up in the sky, there's 10 to 100, to 100 times more uh, water, uh, you know, uh, there. So the, to the point where the atmosphere is often supersaturated with water, not with not with carbon dioxide. All right, that's with, not uh, commonly. All right, you're, what you're claiming is NASA is understating Martian air pressure. Yes. All right. Assuming everything you say about water in the upper atmosphere and water in, in, in the polar region, all that's true, why would, why would NASA, why wouldn't they be thrilled? Why, is, why are we not getting the truth? Yeah, well, that's one way right. of saying the same thing. Give you, let me I, I give you a little bit of background, and then I'll get to why. Because the, okay. the why question is something that everybody wants up front. But it, you have to have somewhat of a background before you can really adequately answer oh, the why background. The first thing we should look at is what happened on the first night that Viking 1 landed on Mars. And that was our first lander, the first successful lander that anybody had on Mars. The Russians had Mars 3 before, and it stopped functioning after 12 seconds. So it was, that was a failure. So when, Mars, when Viking 1 touched down, uh, the scientists who were watching the events unfold were gathered at JPL, Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And when the cameras came on, the first thing they saw was a blue sky, and they also saw some green on patches, uh, green patches on rocks ahead. Now, that looked a lot like Earth, and the green patches looked something like life. So who was running the deal? It was a guy by the name of uh, Dr. James Fletcher who was the NASA administrator, he gave an order that night, immediately upon seeing that, for a technician to go out and to personally go to every single color monitor that was in that room and to turn the dial so that the color of the sky went from a reddish or butterscotch reddish color 
I'm sorry, from blue rather to to, uh, to the reddish or butterscotch yellow. And Somewhere that in was between those two colors. Apparently, the green to on tell the rocks the truth. was wiped out right away. Why? Uh, there was why would no one reason man... why he should have done that unless he was trying to cover something up. Like now, what? here we're talking about 1976 when this occurs. I know you've done research in UFOs, and I hate to go to UFOs. Oh, uh, listen. Point. I hate to go there this, this early in an argument because there's a lot of data. There's that no argument. The but Number you've only one, got. Stop. You're only giving me it's what I've got less than stop. 15 minutes in the show. So stop here I'm going to have to ask you. Now, don't so let go. Let me talk a little I, bit. Barry, my goodness. I wrote Otherwise, a book. Otherwise, you're not going to get the answer to your question. No. Let me interrupt, my goodness gracious. Go I wrote a book called Return of the Giants. It's about the Israeli UFO wave, and it was presented widely on American TV on a show called Sightings and on NBC Live, Bob Kiviet. For that reason, I got known as a UFO writer. In fact, I wrote one book but it got around. It's available at lulu.com, www.lulu.com, write in Return of the Giants. Get the black and whites cheaper. All right, away you go. There I established myself. Okay. I started to say that there was a history before that night in July 1976. And the history, I mean, you can go back before that. You mentioned the giants, the Nephilim, that are mentioned in, in Genesis 6-4. There's a history that goes all the way back in terms of sightings. But the significant thing in term uh, event, and the main one that we, we know of in terms of our government, was the Roswell incident, whether that was real or not. And so after that, <clears throat> there were, and most people probably know, excuse me, a bit of frog in throat. Uh, Most people uh, probably Barry, know. Barry, now just so you know, as a result of my book, I went all over the world presenting the Israeli wave. Amongst the people on the tours were Jesse Marcel Jr., who as an 11-year-old kid in Roswell uh, saw the debris uh, I would his father show it, so brought it home. Yes. All right. After Just that, so the you next know, point, I believe the guy. I think he was telling it, the truth. I know, but I want the, the listeners to know, because you and I have discussed this already. After that, the next uh, date of, of primary interest, I think, would be March 16th of 1967. Maelstrom Air Force Base, where, and there's a link to it on my site, but you, people can look it up online themselves and say, look for Maelstrom Air Force Base, um, you know, UFO incident, 19, March, 19, March 16, 1967. And supposedly UFOs came over the base and a, the squadron or a flight of intercontinental ballistic missiles were shut down for a, a good period of time while they were overhead. So now the government here was very concerned about what's going on. It did not want people to think that we're not in control of the skies. And, you know, people often would say, well, if there's flying saucers, you know, if they'd be coming from stars, you know, other star systems, it's so far away it would take them forever to get here. I don't know that they come from Mars, but, but I do, uh, do believe that when Fletcher saw something on that TV monitor that looked like Earth, and especially the green patches on the rocks that look like, like life, he probably figured, my God, if we let people see this, then there's going to be credibility in the UFO stories, and people will panic. And there are a lot of nasty things that are why, associated why with UFOs. Why would people panic? Why would anyone panic? So, in other panic? words, uh, you hear all these abduction stories. So, therefore, I think he made a, a singular decision, shut it down. Now, all right, I don't are, buy it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. It's not good enough. Why? Be oh, why? 
first of all, that's no motive. And secondly, you're assuming people panic. <laughs> you hear UFOs are real, you go and panic. That's not a, a motivation. Hey, did you ever hear of War of the Worlds being broadcast in 1939 and how I people read it? I know this story. There was a massive and again, panic when the people thought the radio show was, was representing something that was again, real. It was that representing... particular radio show became a part oh, of the gosh, basis of you government go doctrine. On with this anyways was representing a physical attack on Americans from outer space. It doesn't matter. Your reasoning isn't strong enough. Nonetheless... Well, you something... haven't let me finish talking. You're All trying right, to plug your books and, and stuff instead of letting me talk. And, All you right. know, you can do that. I've, I've been looking at 750 on my computer here right now. I'm not going to get to the important points if you keep interrupting me. All right, go All ahead. Right, so just, uh, like I said to you on the phone the other day, let me talk a little bit and let me educate people as to what's going on. All because right. I turned down a talk at the Mars Society last summer. I've spoken there before because they'd only give me 30 minutes. And uh, I said, I can't really represent this subject the right way in under an hour. So we're starting with less than 30 minutes with interruptions over here. Well, and I'll sound you like a nut job if I back. can't get okay. data out to people. And that's why I did not go back to the Mars Society Convention last summer. So in the few minutes that I have left, yes. okay, whatever the motive was, the fact is that when Mars Science Laboratory landed on August the 6th, 2012, after 36 years of disinformation and 36 years of pictures with a reddish sky, we were suddenly allowed to see that, oh, my God, Mars does have a blue sky. And the pictures of Mars taken by MSL since have been blue. So we were given 36 years of crap by the government that started with, with, uh, with James Fletcher. So that's the guy that we, gotta, so we have to look at him and see, well, why did he do that? But whatever his motive was, it happened. Mars has a blue sky. And Which means... It, it's not temperatures you thought, it's a lot warmer. In fact, at MSL, at Gale Crater Mars, the temperatures uh, most days, at least half the days since it landed, the high temperatures have been above freezing. Now, how cold do they get at night? You thought the other day 200 below zero. But actually, it's a lot warmer than that at Gale Crater, maybe 70 or 80 below, they think. But however, they, they now think maybe not, uh, maybe a lot warmer than that, because there's something called perchlorate, perchlorates that's in the Martian brine they discovered under the surface there. That's like an antifreeze that keeps things warmed up. I'm off the subject a little bit. Let me come back to the air pressure because I don't right. have much time to explain. There's, a, there's a, a nice explanation for why the government is wrong, and then there's a not, not a nice answer. There's two, two ways you can choose on this. You can either go with incompetence and bad design of the pressure sensors, or you can go with deliberate disinformation. I'll make the, cur the case first for incompetence. What happened was this. We noticed in looking at the 8,338 hours or 30, 33 hours, whatever it was, of data, that at 7.30 every morning, local Mars time, the pressure would go up. And at 8.30 every morning, local Mars time, the pressure would go down. Mm -hmm. So what was that? The, the pressure sensor, the transducer, they all are designed like this. They have dust filters in them. And the dust filter sizes are only a few millimeters across. They're very tiny. There's no way to change them at all. Mars's weather is primarily driven by dust to a great extent. That's what dust storms and dust devils are all about. So what happened was when the Viking landed and the air access tube allowed air to suck in, you know, to where the pressure sensor was, that air had to go first by the dust filter. That air would come in, we did experiments at Emory Riddle, at supersonic velocities. If it, you know, if it starts out coming out, you have a vacuum on the inside from outer space, and it lands on Mars and exposed to the Martian atmosphere, it's going to come in at supersonic speeds until the pressure equalizes. That's going to be a very tiny fraction of a second. When that air came, when that dust came in with the air, it clogged the filter. So what happened at 7.30 every morning? At 7.30 every morning, they turned on the, uh, the heat access from something called an RTG, a radio thermoelectric generator. And that RTG provided heat so that the instruments could work. Otherwise, the, the thought was everything would freeze solid in the Martian night. And in fact, 
none of the instruments were, uh, were designed to operate at, at air temperatures that we think are on Mars at night. They were all frozen. So they had to have this heat come in at regular intervals. 7.30 was one of those times as they started the daily operations. So what happened is when the air came in, when the warm air came in from the RTG, uh, then it, it, it reached the area behind the dust filter. Imagine a bottle that's sealed, and you put a Bunsen burner or a heater under it. What's going to happen to the pressure inside that bottle? If there's no way for the air to escape, the pressure's going to go up. That's what happened at Viking 1. That's what happened at Viking 2. We've seen it, by the way, also on MSL, on the Mars Science Laboratory. As soon as it got warm and toasty enough, where they didn't need the heater on anymore, they would turn it off or simply turn off the access to the heater, and the pressure would go down. It was a very definite pattern. We could generally predict the pressure within, uh, within 2% of the correct amount. Uh, now, what based if it was on deliberate? Time of That's day. And this is, you know, I've got on, on, the, on the Mars Correct site, you know, uh, and I, you really haven't spoken about that, MarsCorrect.com. Uh, if people go there and they click on um, the top line there, after it says home, it says Mars Correct website contents, there are two things I would point out for your, your, your listeners. I know we're down about a minute or two. We're doing so The first fine. thing under it is PowerPoint for Mars Correct, critique of all NASA Mars weather data with emphasis on pressure. And the second thing is basic report for Mars Correct. That one was updated uh, this is February 18th over here, and, uh, and, and that's a 102-page report. However, in that 102-page report, you can click on the table of contents in there, and you get to all the annexes and tendencies with all the data from those 8,333 hours or so. The whole report's over 700 pages of data. It's an enormous amount of data, you know, but the findings of that data were very consistent. And who believes it? Well, I will tell you that NASA is at my websites on a daily basis or darn close to it. So is Russia. So is the European Space Agency. I've never received a single word of criticism from any of them. And it seems like every time I put a new article, they're there. For some reason, Estonia is there also. I think Estonia, their, their, their intelligence services are friendly to the United States. They're representing the Baltic states. Um, okay, yeah. again, ma one word, M-A-R-S-C-O-R-R-E-C-T dot com. There's your site. All right, so the rest, I, you know, I said uh, maybe you want to do a show another time on Mars, but if they look at the PowerPoint and they look at the report, They'll have what they need. You go through the rest of the table of contents. Uh, I mean, they, they, I'm publishing almost on a daily basis. I just had an extensive article I put up about ultraviolet radiation on Mars. But uh, either it's either oh. their mistakes were due to, to bad design. They should have had a way to change the dust filter. That would have solved a lot of problems. Uh, All right, we've got to thank you. Um, listen, um, uh, uh, a terrific guest. We were very lucky. Uh, thank you, Barry, for being on the show. Quite welcome. Uh, uh, Rothman, of course. And as I said, he's one of the few people uh, who uh, uh, met uh, me and Cindy in person at her wedding, and I'll always remember that. Thank you, Barry. Don't lose me. Okay. Night, all. Thanks for having me. Bye. And I'll see Bye. you next Tuesday. This has been Barry Chapman. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month. And you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25. Or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program 
happen. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. The president's executive order that would protect millions of illegal immigrants from being deported is still blocked. Jerry Bodlander reports. In a two-to-one ruling, a federal appeals court in New Orleans has refused to lift an order blocking the president's executive action from going into effect. It rejected the government's request upholding